Howdy folks and welcome to the World of Tax patch 10.0 test server with the mighty jingles. I uh, was a little bit late getting onto the test server because I was at London MCM Comic Con over the weekend but I didn't waste any time getting this thing downloaded and installed and uh, up and running in order to get some videos done of what you can expect to see on the brand new patch 10.0 test server. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the things that I was looking forward to seeing just aren't here. Um, which was kind of disappointing. A whole bunch of new tanks promised in patch 10.0, at least according to the in development section on the World of Tanks webpage. But, um, well, this is pretty much it. Um, yeah. However, the Centurion Action 10, more of which we'll be looking at later. But the Chieftain Mark VI? Nope, not there. A whole bunch of brand new American artillery? Nope, not there. New French heavy tank, the AMX M4 1949. Um, nope, not there. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, Panzer 58, I think it was called. Uh, a brand new German tier 8 medium. Nope, nothing. Diddly, nada, zip, zilch. Diddly squat. Well, however, is the Centurion Action 10, which is the replacement for the FV 4202, the British tier 10 medium tank. And this thing... In its current form, anyway, remember this is the test server, everything is subject to change, this thing is fantastic. But before we take a closer look at the Centurion Action 10, uh, I wanted to briefly, uh, you know, as briefly as I ever go over anything, I, I really don't want to spend the whole video talking about this, but there's a, well, there's quite a controversial new feature come out, in, or due to come out in patch 10.0, and it's to do with inscriptions and emblems. So I'm going to use the Centurion Mark VII as an example because I've stripped it bare, I've taken all of the camo patterns off that I previously had applied, uh, which I bought with gold, and uh, the various inscriptions that I had on the tank because I had gnome written on the side of my tank because I can. And we're going to take a look at, um, at what exactly it's going to cost you in order to outfit your tank with these emblems and inscriptions and the bonuses that they're going to give you. But first, we're going to take a look at how World of Warships does this, because this is basically where the inspiration has come from. It's the signal flags that you can get in World of Warships. Let's have a look up here. And yes, it is Halloween in World of Warships, as you can quite clearly see. Uh, here is my Atago Premium Tier 8 Cruiser, and here are the various different signal flags that I can fly from this ship. As you can see, I've got a few of them. Hotel Yankee, the vessel with which I have been in collision, has sunk. This is the Hotel Yankee signal flag. And what that does, if you're flying this flag, in the next battle you get minus 20% to damage received when ramming the enemy, and you get plus 50% to damage caused when ramming the enemy. Now you can buy all of these signal flags in the premium shop if you wish, but you don't have to, because you can earn them by various different achievements. The Hotel Yankee flag, for example, is earned from the Die Hard achievement. If you have a look down here, equal speed Charlie London, 50% to experience earned in the battle. That's a huge bonus. And you get that for the Confederate Award. So you don't actually have to spend any money on earning these inscriptions, if you like, uh, the World of Warships version, here in World of Warships. Instead, you can just earn them by basically being a good player. And when I was at the World of Warships press event at the Chatham Dockyard, a little birdie told me that a very, very similar thing was coming with inscriptions and emblems in World of Tanks. I wasn't allowed to talk about it because it hadn't been cleared for public release yet, so I was looking forward with some anticipation to how World of Tanks were going to implement this based on the World of Warships model. Well, that's not what they've done. What they've done in World of Tanks is a bit controversial, and using my Centurion Mark VII, I'm going to demonstrate it. Here we go. Hit the extension button, and I've stripped everything off my Centurion Mark VII in order to demonstrate exactly what this is going to cost you. So, we have slots for three camouflage patterns, exactly the same as previously. Uh, one winter camouflage pattern, one summer camouflage pattern, and one desert camouflage pattern. Now, you can either pay gold or credits for these, and this is where all the fuss is coming from. So, for gold, 225 gold for one winter camo and 225 gold for one summer camo and 225 gold for one desert camo so there's 675 gold currently sitting in the cart let's go back to our emblems and inscriptions 
Okay, two inscription slots. So we'll go for Harbinger of the Apocalypse, 135 gold. The one good thing here is that if I was to buy Harbinger of the Apocalypse twice, it wouldn't cost me any more because I've already unlocked it once on this tank. But let's cancel that and let's add Steel Warrior. So there's another 135 gold. We'll go back to categories. The Centurion Mark VII only has one emblem slot, which is a bit of a bummer, but we'll pay for one emblem. There we go. Um, Flag of Ecuador. 1% bonus to the major qualification of all crew members. And we'll add that to the card. I've now spent over 1,080 gold in order to add three different camo patterns and uh, two inscriptions and one emblem to my Centurion Mark 7. 1,080 gold. And that's given me 3% to the skills of all crew members and 3% to my camo rating, regardless of which map I end up on. That's a lot of gold. Oh, before I forget, 2% on my commander as well. However, a lot of these come with conditions. The camo is active all the time. The emblem is active all the time. 1% to all of my crew members. Harbinger of the Apocalypse, which adds 2% to the qualification of all my crew members, is only active for 30 seconds after I've destroyed an enemy vehicle. Hmm. Steel Warrior is active all the time. But it's only for the commander, not for the entire crew. So I've spent over a thousand gold on this tank and, well, th the bonuses aren't even active all the time. Now, obviously, you can choose bonuses that are active all the time. So, for example, Harbinger of the Apocalypse, 2% to the major qualification of all crew members, but it's only active for 30 seconds after you've destroyed an enemy vehicle. Okay, uh, let's filter it. Let's go all crew members. Um, and basically, if we want a 2% bonus, there are conditions that come attached to it, as you can see here. If you want a 1% bonus, that's active all the time. So we'll go for Brothers in Arms, uh, Steel Warrior, that's just for the Commander, so we'll remove that. Uh, let's see, God Save the Queen. Again, all crew members, we'll add that. So there we go. Do the purchases, back to categories, and now we have 3% to all crew members and 3% to all of our camo. Uh, this is a lot like an extra equipment slot on your tank. Go back to the garage. There we go. Improved ventilation, class 2. 5% to all of your crew skills. Well, 3% and 5% isn't too different, is it? Well, it's not, but that brings us on to another uh, little problem. The Centurion Mark 7 only has one emblem slot. Let's find another tank. Hopefully, first time, I'll find another tier 9 medium. That... here we go, the E50. Exterior of the E50. Fingers crossed. There you go. Why does the E50 have two emblem slots? With the E50, I could have a 4% bonus to all of my crew members, which is almost as good as improved ventilation. Not Every tank has the same number of emblem and inscription slots, even tanks of the same type and the same tier. So, you know, that's kind of annoying. But where things start to get seriously exasperating is if you're going to buy these things for credits. Let me just remove the camo from the E50, and I don't have any inscriptions or emblem... Or, sorry, forgot to speak English there for a second. I don't have any inscriptions or emblems on the E50. So, we're going to add for credits our camo, and then our emblems, and then our inscriptions to the E50. And that's 90,000 credits for the winter camo. It's another 90,000 credits for the summer camo. And it's another 90,000 credits for the desert camo. Back to categories, and let's pick some emblems. I'll just filter it quickly. All crew. Some emblems that are going to give us a flat always-on bonus to our crew skills. So we're going to go with the flag of Honduras. There you go. No conditions attached to that one. That's fifth... No, it's not. It's 540,000 credits. No, it isn't. It's 54,000 credits. I've forgotten how to speak. Uh, <laughs> and count. So there's that. Um, we're going to put that emblem on the other side of the tank as well. Unfortunately... Having already paid for that emblem, because we're putting it on the other side of the tank, we then have to pay for it again. Oh, great. So, more expense. Let's go for the inscriptions. Um, inscriptions that only affect all crew. 
Again, because we want them to not have any conditions attached, we want the bonus on all the time, we can only pick the 1% bonuses. So we'll have SAR on one side of the tank, or the front of the tank rather, and for the second slot, we'll stick it here as well. Now, with the inscriptions, if you've already paid for it on one location on the tank, you don't have to pay for it again. So we're going to be cheap here, and uh, we're going to add that to the cart. Oh, hell's bells. No, we do have to pay for that again. Fantastic. So, 486,000 credits. That's what it's going to cost us. We'll apply them to give us a 4% bonus to all of our crew members all of the time, regardless of circumstances, and to have 3% bonus camo, regardless of which map we end up on. And you have to do that every month. For every tank. <laughs> you can see where the controversy arises, can't you? Um, this is just ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. That's half a million credits, which is about the cost of... Um, well, there we go. Improved Ventilation Class 2, which costs around half a million credits and has around about the same effect. It's 5% bonus to all your crew skills. Equipping a tank that can even have, because let's not forget, not all tanks are the same. The E-50 can have two emblems and two inscriptions. The Centurion Mark 7 can have two inscriptions and you have one emblem for some bizarre reason. But you're looking at around about half a million credits every month for every tank that you own that you want to remain competitive because this is a huge buff. It's the equivalent of having a fourth equipment slot. Um, and it's absolutely bloody absurd. You could certainly, I mean it's not outside the bounds of possibility that you could afford to maintain this amount of um, decoration, if you like, functional decoration on all of the tanks that you want. But that depends on how many tanks you have and how many tanks you wish to remain competitive with. Um, certainly when you start getting up to the high tiers, tier 8, 9 and 10, people start taking the game very, very seriously indeed. Now, if you have a bunch of tier 8 premiums, for example, like the Panther 88, the Type 59 and so on and so on, um, these tanks do have a credit bonus modifier. So you can, depending on how good you are at World of Tanks and how much time you have available to do nothing but grind credits, you could, for an evening spent playing, for example, the Type 59 or the Panther 88, grind out a million credits, which would roughly be enough to renew all of the camouflage, all of the inscriptions and all of the emblems on two of your Tier 10s. But that's just two of your tier 10s. And that's a million credits that you can't use to invest in the latest equipment module for whichever tank you happen to be grinding at the time. It's almost as if, you know, the cynic inside me is tempted to say that Wargaming have made this such a massive ball ache that people are going to be tempted to say, screw it and just spend a thousand gold per tank in order to not have to go through the hassle of doing this every month. And... Frankly, yeah, that's just not good. That's a bad thing. If I don't know if any of you guys have watched Quickie Baby's video about the emblems and the inscriptions on the tanks, but I am 100% fully in agreement with him. Um, this would not be quite so bad if there was no rental period associated with buying these things for credits, because you're talking half a million credits per tank, certainly at tier 10. Half a million credits are over a thousand gold. People are going to want to pay for it with credits. I mean, a thousand gold per tank is a lot of money. You know, real money. Um, and it's not unreasonable to expect people to grind that amount of credits just to kit out a tank with a full range of camouflage emblems and inscriptions if they were going to get to keep them. If they didn't have to renew it and do it again every month for every tank that they own. If that was the case, then, yeah, this wouldn't be such a bad idea at all. I mean, that's doable. That's something that you can grind towards. That's something that you can aim for. It's a, it's, it's a goal that you can set yourself and say, right, okay, I'm going to grind out a couple of million credits and all of my Tier 10 tanks or all of my Tier 8 tanks, Tier 9 tanks, what, whatever level of progression you are through the game, all of those tanks I am going to kit out with a full range of camouflage, emblems, and inscriptions. And it would take your time, but it would be doable. And you wouldn't have to do it every month. Uh, as things stand, I uh, no, I can't recommend this at all. It's just a ridiculous amount of grinding. Um, it's almost 
again, you know, the wise and old cynic in me is very, very tempted to say it's almost as if Wargaming have made this such a massive ball ache for people to attempt to do for free that the majority of people are just going to say, screw it, I don't have the time for this, and they're just going to reach into their wallets and pay for it with gold. And personally, I think that's a very, very short-sighted approach. If this is the case, it's not necessarily, you know, the way they've intended it to happen, but it looks like it is. And, uh, you know, if it looks like shit, smells like shit, and sounds like shit, um, you know, it's probably shit. So, yeah. Emblems and inscriptions. Um, no. <laughs> Sorry, Wargaming. Um, try again. Anyway, that's the bad news. Let's move on to the good news. The good news, if you're just getting into World of Tanks, you're a new player, is that there is uh, additional support via things that they're calling the Proving Grounds for basically teaching new players the ropes. The idea is, I believe, once you've finished your World of Tanks tutorial, the battle training section, um, the next step that you would take would be to go into what they're calling the Proving Grounds. It's only for Tier 1 and 2 vehicles. And it basically is a PvE mode. It's a... well... Uh, I'm tempted to say it's a bit like Armoured Warfare's uh, single-player mission, co-op battles, but it's not quite that sophisticated. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's certainly a step in the right direction. Although it is a little disappointing, particularly after listening to Victor Kisley uh, talk about how he wanted to bring more PvE content in the world of tanks uh, in the address that he gave us at Tankfest. And, well, this is certainly a step in the right direction, but, well... The thing is, the bots are absolutely terrible. I was kind of hoping that this might be more like the co-op battles that you see in World of Warships. World of Warships actually has a fairly decent system for new players. When you first start playing, all you can play is co-op battles until you've advanced in player rank enough to unlock random battles. And the bots, the AI in World of Warships, are actually really, really good. They're... When I say really, really good, I don't mean that they never miss every shot that they fire and they know exactly where you're going to be because, you know, they use bot hacks that reveal your location on the map and blah, blah. No, I mean, they seem realistically human. They're not infallible. They make the same kind of mistakes that players would make, but they also play the same way that players would play. They're actually very, very good bots in World of Warships, and I was hoping to see something like that here in World of Tanks. But sadly, that's not the case. They're just bad. They move forward until they spot an enemy tank, and then they just sit there stationary, turn their turrets towards them, and as soon as they have a clear line of fire, they fire. And that's as sophisticated as they get. Although, I suppose, maybe I'm being a little too critical here, because that's about as sophisticated as the gameplay gets when you're playing against other players in Tier 1 and 2 battles. So, yeah, perhaps I'm just asking for a little bit too much here. Nevertheless, I was hoping for a little bit more, but again, bear in mind this is aimed at players who have just started playing the game, so it would probably be a little bit too much to expect them to put some advanced bot coding in there and, you know, have people side-scraping and, uh, yeah, okay, fair enough. All right, you got me. It's, it's good enough. It does pretty much exactly what it says on the tin. Um, but this is definitely by no means any kind of PvE content. Um, in the way that you have in Armored Warfare, and that you have in World of Warships. But again, if we're being completely fair, it's not really been advertised as such. This is quite simply just for new players to get an idea of how the tank is going to move and perform, and what the game is going to look like uh, before they get unleashed against professional SEAL clubbers in T-18 tank destroyers in regular Tier 2 battles. So in that respect, it pretty much works exactly as advertised. What does definitely need a little tuning, however, is the fact that it doesn't matter how many kills you get, you lose money when you're playing in this mode. You don't earn any experience, you don't earn any credits, and you have to pay for your repairs, and you have to pay for your ammunition. And while losing three to 400 credits per game doesn't seem like an awful lot for those of us with tier 8, 9 and 10 tanks, when all you have is tier 1 and 2 tanks, yeah, you can do without that. All of which finally brings us on to the Centurion Action 10. Unfortunately, no sign of the Chieftain, despite various promises that were made. Um, but the Centurion Action 10, the replacement for the FE4202, which is no longer in the garage or the tech tree... The, oh, this is a worthy... <laughs> this is a really, really good tank. Um, I cannot wait. I mean, I liked the FE4202. Um, it wasn't particularly good. But it wasn't bad either, and they buffed the reload on the gun, 
and made it competitive with the Soviet Tier 10 mediums. And it was okay, but this thing is awesome. I mean, this thing is, is really, really nice. It feels like a British tank with a Soviet turret. You know how bouncy the front of the turret of the old Centurion 7 one can be under the right circumstances. And you look at this thing and you think, hmm, I don't know about that. I mean, the 4202, the turret was definitely the weakness of the 4202 because that's such a massive turret ring. Well, this is kind of similar, but the turret armour, it's 198 millimetres at the front, at the thickest. Now, unfortunately, Tanks GG doesn't yet have this tank in their database, so I can't actually look up the various different armour zone thicknesses for you. But trust me when I tell you that this thing has a really, really bouncy turret. In fact, don't trust me, I'll show you how bouncy the turret of this tank is when we show you some of the replays. The hull armour isn't terrible either. Uh, 120 millimetres at the front, but it is sloped at 60 degrees. So, not bad. You still don't want to be exposing your hull, if at all possible, in this thing. And that's why it plays a lot like one of the Soviet mediums. Particularly because it's also received a speed buff. Gone are the days of plodding around at 40 kilometres per hour in very, very powerful tanks. It does have a 1,040 horsepower engine, and it's only a 55 ton tank. This thing has a power to weight ratio of 18.77, which isn't bad at all. Don't forget, these British mediums are, well, they're heavies in all but name. Certainly they are in size. Let's have a look, for example, at some heavy tanks, like the Carnarvon. It's the same size. <laughs> um, oh, wow. They've replaced the Carnarvon's turret as well. Oh, this is fantastic news. This is really, really good. I... Wow, uh, check that out. Discovering things as we go along. I did not realise they'd replaced the Carnarvon's turret. The Carnarvon now has what is basically the Centurion Action 10 turret. Look at that, 198 millimetres of armour. I liked the Carnarvon, and I think I'm going to like it a hell of a lot more now. Um, ooh, I'm <laughs> Bloody hell, Jingles, didn't you know that? No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, check that out. I, I show you the Carnarvon just to show you how big the Centurion Action 10 is and discover that the Carnarvon's had a massive stealth buff as well by being given the same turret as the new Centurion. That is really, really good. Anyway, more on that later. But again, you can see how big the Centurion Action 10 is. Uh, medium tank? Well, yeah. But size-wise, it's, it's, it's a heavy. And the fact that this thing will do 53 kilometers per hour with that kind of power-to-weight ratio is very, very nice. It feels, certainly as far as the mobility is concerned, very competitive with the Soviet Tier 10 mediums. In fact, there have been a number of occasions where I've been chasing T-62As and just wishing the guy would get out of the way so I could overtake him. Um, that's how good the mobility of this tank is. It's got a fantastic turret. It's got a great gun. It's very mobile. Check out the stats on the gun. It's the 105mm L7A2, 6.98 rounds per minute, 268mm of penetration, 330 with high explosive anti tank, 105. That's not bad penetration actually for high explosive. 390 damage, 480 with the HE, 0.32 accuracy, and a pretty good, who, what, am I, what do I mean, pretty good, a very good 2.1 second aiming time. It's a great gun. It's the gun that basically armed NATO. Um, <laughs> this gun has appeared on the guns of just about every nationality of tank in NATO. In fact, even a couple of former Warsaw Pact countries. I've seen T-55s um, with this gun equipped. It's that good a gun. And it's a great gun here in World of Tanks as well. Um, this is a really, really nice tank. They're probably still going to mess around with the stats before this thing goes live, but as long as they don't mess around with it too much, it's a very, very worthy successor to the FE-4202. Also, the turret traverse is ridiculous as well. Look at that. 48 degrees per second and a 50 degree per second hull traverse. Just, oh yes, we need this tank in our lives. And let's have a look at the thing in action. Now, standard test server terms and conditions do apply. Um, you're going to have gold ammunition fired at you continuously, but that's not really such an issue. Certainly not if they're firing high explosive anti-tank ammo at you because, well, you've got side skirts on this tank, spaced armour, so if they're stupid enough to fire heat into your side skirts, it's not going to do any damage, and you've got a very, very well-sloped turret, so heat ammunition does not get any normalisation against sloped armour, so yeah, bring it on, bitches. Nevertheless, 
Don't get upset when people are doing nothing but spamming gold at you. It's the test server, it's what they do here. Also, you're probably going to find yourself getting team killed a lot by angry Russian kids if you don't have a Russian server tag. Again, that's just the test server, that's the way they do things here. This was not a particularly good match, um, for reasons which will become apparent later on, but what this is going to demonstrate is just how spectacularly bouncy the turret of the century in Action 10 is. Here we go. There's actually a heck of a lot more enemy tanks than what we've just seen coming down from this side of the map. He fires on the move, tracks eat it, waggle the armor there, absorb it with the spaced armor on the side, turret bounces another shot. While the 105mm gun doesn't have the rate of fire of the Soviet 100mm guns, it does do a lot more damage. It's not unusual to do well over 400 damage per hit with this gun. And the rate of fire isn't that bad. There we go. T-57 heavy there. And another bounce on the turret. Now, the Century in Action 10 isn't the only tier 10 medium tank that's got a very, very bouncy turret. The Soviet and Chinese medium tanks also have good turret armor, but the Century in Action 10, and there's another bounce from the turret, has something that they don't, good gun depression. So while Soviets and Chinese mediums in this sort of position have to get creative and take a number of risks uh, in order to be able to get the gun down over the other end of a ridge like this, it's pretty much easy mode in the Century in Action 10. Got a number of enemy tanks just sitting there waiting for me to crest the ridge again. And the T-57 Heavy over there has gotten so sick and tired of me bouncing shots that, well, there we go, I bounced one, and then you heard the sizzle. Uh, <laughs> high explosive anti-tank ammunition. Um, at some point it's going to happen. Um, the turret is well sloped, but it's only really well sloped from just below the gun. Not the gun mantlet, this tank doesn't have a gun mantlet. Uh, but underneath the gun, the armour is kind of flat. Um, it's almost like that big old turret ring that the FV4202 has. But the thing is, the tank's got such gun depression that you don't really need to expose that part of the turret. Certainly not on terrain like this, and I, it's time I was getting out of here. There's far too many enemy tanks over there, and the two tanks that went up ahead are about to die, if they haven't already. There they go. Um, pinging for help. Have a look at that Jagdpanzer E100 over there. This is what I was talking about when I said this wasn't a fantastic game. Test server, live server, certain things are consistent regardless of which server on which you're playing World of Tanks. Have a look at the Jagdpanzer E100 to the north of the friendly base. He hasn't moved from that position this entire game. He's been 100% useless this entire game, but that doesn't matter now because now the flank has fallen and the base is about to get overrun. He's in the perfect position to provide overwatch fire for me as I spot the guys from the hollow up ahead as I'm furiously pinging. <laughs> help defend the base. So what does he do? He turns around and he heads north into the town. Oh, you couldn't make this shit up. The good thing about being in this situation in the Centurion Action 10 is that I'm fast enough to be able to disengage from that mess of enemy tanks over there in the way that the Centurion 7 just with its 40 km per hour top speed wouldn't have been able to do. The T-62A would have caught me. Um, if the Jagdpanzer E100 had remained on that ridgeline where he'd spent the entire game up until now, I could have stayed in that hollow. There's a spot I've just passed where you usually find the enemy artillery when you're attacking down this side of the map. Um, and I could have exploited the gun depression and the turret in order to spot targets for the Jagdpanzer E100, but it's almost as if he just doesn't want to get any damage done. <laughs> any time it looks like he might be in a position to shoot an enemy tank, he moves. Um, all of which is quite ironic because if you have a look at the other side of the map, the area that I've just vacated, we have an STB-1 who's managed to work his way around and trying to come up behind the enemy tanks who are threatening the base. But as luck would have it, and this happens far too often in World of Tanks, the STB-1 has just been one-shotted by an enemy Death Star. Enemy Death Star has been in the same location since I was down that end of the map with absolutely nothing to shoot at. So frustrating, but the STB-1 had to be thinking, this is it, I'm going to win the game for the team, coming around behind the enemy tanks who are about to attack the base. Only a complete idiot would still be in this location. Yes, but complete idiots play World of Tanks a lot. <laughs> and so there was a Death Star there. Why wouldn't he be there? <laughs> there was nothing to shoot at. Where else would you expect him to go? Oh, World of Tanks. Some things are consistent regardless of which server you're playing on. 
Anybody kind of come back and help me defend the base? I mean, it's not like they don't know. But of course, nobody is. The turret is going to keep me in play for a little bit longer. It's just bounced another shot. I think it was from the T-62A. Not entirely sure. There's the gun depression. And a, another bounce. Despite the less than intelligent play from the team in this match, you can't deny that the turret of this tank really is spectacularly good. It's taken multiple hits and it's only been penetrated once. Oh, crap. Come on. And yeah, as soon as you start to expose the hull, that's when the tank starts taking damage. There's no way I'm surviving this, of course. We could have won this if it hadn't been for two things. If it hadn't been for the Yagpanzer E100 on our team and the idiot in the FV215B on the enemy team, who's probably still in the same location, uh, we could have won this. Unfortunately, um, the best that I can say out of this particular battle was that it did at least demonstrate how good the turret of the Centurion Action 10 is. And that's pretty much it for this game. Anyway, moving along swiftly. Another battle. This time we're on Westfield. And, well, just check out the mobility of this machine. Note the T-62A off to my left, on the other side of the Batchat. Now, in a straight line, the Batchat is going to beat the Centurion Action 10 in a drag race. It's got a faster top speed. But I'm easily pulling ahead of the T-62A. And the T-62A is not a slow tank. It's the 53 km per hour top speed with the over 1,000 horsepower engine on this 55 ton tank. Uh, very, very competitive with regards to the Soviet and Chinese tier 10 mediums when it comes to mobility. And the 50 degree per second hull traverse and the 48 degree per second turret traverse make this thing a very, very nasty close in brawling tank. Or at least I imagine it would. I've never really used it for that. <laughs> there we go, the T62A has only just caught up with me. Um, I like tanks that give me options. I like tanks that allow me to be flexible in the way that I play. I don't necessarily like being forced into one role because that's all a tank is good for. Um, this tank has a very accurate gun. It's very good as a long range sniper. It's great at working ridges because of the gun depression and the bouncy turret. It's also, should the situation arise and you have to do it, not bad at all at brawling and dogfighting because it's got that fantastic turret and hull traverse and the rate of fire while in that sort of situation you ideally would want to have the 100mm gun on one of the Soviet mediums, the rate of fire isn't that bad, particularly if you've equipped the inscriptions and emblems that boost the crew skills of your loader, for example. With inscriptions, emblems, crew skills and a gun rammer, I've got the reload of this 105mm gun down to 7.24 seconds. And with 390 average damage, that gives this thing a potential damage per minute of over 3,200. And that's right up there with the best tier 10 medium tanks. There isn't an awful lot to dislike about the Centurion Action 10. It doesn't really have any... Well, okay, what are the bad points about this tank? I mean, I've been doing nothing but singing its praises the entire game. Um, okay, let me have a think. Bad points about the Centurion Action 10. Um, nope, sorry. <laughs> it's a great tank. 410 meter view range, 750 meter signal range, great gun, fantastic turret, spaced side armor, powerful engine. The suspension seems really, really good as well. It's It hasn't sacrificed any of that. Well, the thing that I really liked about the Centurion 7-1 and the FE4202 was the powerful engine and the good ground resistance of the suspension. Uh, and I was kind of worried that if there was anything bad about the Centurion Action 10, that would be it. But no, it, it seems to have that ability to move backwards and forwards, to, to get going from a standing start very quickly in exactly the way that the Centurion 7 won and exactly the way that the FE4202 had. And on top of that, it's 13 kilometers per hour faster. 
And that was the one thing above all else that really held back the Centurion Mark 7 and the FP4202, the fact that neither of them were really fast medium tanks. I mean, they certainly weren't slow, but with a 40 km per hour top speed, they were definitely lacking when it came to needing to be somewhere else very, very quickly. And I need to be somewhere else very, very quickly now, because there's a whole bunch of auto-loading artillery on the enemy team desperate to punch my ticket, and with a 53 km per hour top speed, fantastic suspension, the ability to get moving from a standing start to top speed very, very quickly, in exactly the same way that the Mark 7 Centurion and the 4202 had, I'm able to get the hell out of the danger zone as those two Batchat 15558s pepper the area behind me with their high explosive cannon fire. And I can do it better in the Action 10 because it's got a 53 km per hour top speed as opposed to the 40 km per hour top speed of the Centurion 7 and the 4202. And go for the tracks. Yep. Oh, did I? Yes, I did. I got it just before he was finished off, so excellent. And there goes the last of the enemy artillery. 15-5. Not a bad result. Certainly not a fantastic result. Nobody on the team managed to get a fantastic result out of that because it was just such a landslide victory, but I did manage to come top on damage done. So, yeah. And, you know, this is me here. You do have to temper your expectations. It's not like you're watching Quickie Baby or Circumflexes. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> I don't have time to sit here playing for seven hours in order to get a fantastic game, so I'm afraid games like this are just going to have to do. So, World of Tanks patch 10.0. Um, it's a bit of a hmm kind of patch. I mean, on the one hand, we've got the absolutely fantastic Centurion Action 10, and it really is an amazing tank. But on the other hand, where's the Chieftain? Uh, <laughs> we were promised the Chieftain. There's no Chieftain. There's a whole bunch of other tanks that are listed uh, as coming out in patch 10.0, uh, both premium and regular non-premium tanks, listed in the in-development section for patch 10.0, and there is no sign of them as of yet on the test server. Who knows, in a uh, in a separate version of the test, maybe they'll start drip-feeding those in. Then you've got the Proving Grounds mode, which I don't want to be too critical about, because at the end of the day it is for people who are very, very new to World of Tanks, but the bots are absolutely terrible. <laughs> they are complete idiots. Um, which is kind of disappointing, because when you look at what Armored Warfare are doing, I mean, the, the bots in the PvE co-op modes in Armored Warfare aren't geniuses, but they're better than this. Um, so, yeah, okay, it's a good start, it's a step in the right direction, and I do know that Wargaming do want to introduce more PvE content into World of Tanks. Uh, Victor Kisley himself has said so. I was there, I heard him, and that's, well, you know, a step in the right direction. Uh, at least we know that they're working on bot AI. And who knows with the return of historical battles, which is something that they want to do. Uh, and that's where Victor Kisley has said that, you know, he, he that's where he sees the future of PvE mode in World Attacks. But regardless, it's definitely not coming in patch 10.0. As it is, the Proving Grounds are just a sort of training wheels environment for people who are very, very new to World Attacks. And to be completely fair to Wargaming, it was never advertised as anything other than that. It's just me being, you know, hoping for a little bit more. And then, of course, there's the whole inscription and emblem thing, which is one of the major features of patch 10.0. And, I, I, well, I feel I went into sufficient detail about my feelings on that at the beginning of the video. I'm not going to belabor the point here. Suffice to say, Wargaming, no, there are better ways of doing this. It, it wouldn't be so bad if you could earn the emblems and the inscriptions um, in the same way that you can in World of Warships. And to be completely fair, I do believe, because if you had a look at the filter for the emblems and the inscriptions, they were purchased and mission rewards. So some of them are going to be available as mission rewards, but all of them are available as rewards in World of Warships. In World of Warships, you can buy them from the premium shop, or you can go out and earn them just by playing the game. It's all about giving your customers options. And when I say it's all about giving your customers options, Wargaming, expecting people to grind out millions upon millions upon millions of credits just in order to remain competitive with everybody else who is putting their hand in their pocket and paying for these things with gold, that is not an option. You're going to have to do better. So for now, that's pretty much it for patch 10.0. Although I do realise I haven't showed you the domination mode yet, and there's almost certainly going to be more to show in future versions of the test server because there's a whole bunch of other tanks that are in development and scheduled for release in patch 10.0 that we just haven't seen yet, and I'm sure they're going to be coming in a future update. But we're coming up to 40 minutes of video now, so I'm really going to have to knock it on the head and call it a day here. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, those of us who are currently sitting with FV4202s in our garages, 
have got good times ahead when patch 10.0 comes out because we're gonna get the Centurion Action 10 instead and it is an absolutely fantastic tank. And with that, I'm glad I could end this video on a high note. That's it for today, folks. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.